Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to our panel discussion for the Story of Plastic event. My name is Tejinder Gill, I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator at Willoughby City Council. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that wherever we are in Australia, we're on traditional Aboriginal lands. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Now this is actually the 10th year anniversary of Plastic Free July, which is a campaign that was started by Rebecca Prince Ruiz in Perth, WA, as a way of us trying to reassess our use of plastic. Since then, it's grown into a worldwide phenomenon. So this panel discussion and the virtual movie screening is one of the events that we've been running as part of our Plastic Free July events. So hopefully everyone's had a chance to watch the movie. It's compelling viewing, it's um, quite uh, disheartening in places, but I'm confident that after our panel discussion, we'll all leave feeling empowered and inspired that we can actually make a difference to what's happening out there in the, with the issue of plastics. You'll notice that your microphones are muted and your video is off. This is just so that um, we have a better sound quality and video quality, but we would like this session to be interactive. So please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and send through any questions that occur to you as the panel um, goes on. We have had some questions already sent through for the panelists, but if um, others occur to you, we will try and get through as many as we can. Please direct your questions at the um, questions for panelists link rather than the co-hosts. Now, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. I'm delighted that we've got three eminent uh, members of the community on our panel today. Um, first of all, we've got Mayor Gail Giles Gidney, who is uh, Mayor of Willoughby City Council. Um, mayor Gail has lived in the Willoughby area since 1996. She was elected as a councillor in 2009 and has been mayor since 2014. She's the president of the Northern Sydney Regional Organisation of Councils, which is an eight member council group in the North Shore. She's always had a strong environmental interest and was a founding member of the National Bush Carers uh, Major Day Out and is vice president of that organisation. She's also been taking the Plastic Free July Challenge this month and has done a series of video logs about her journey over that time. So feel free to check those out on our Facebook page or on our website. Welcome, Mayor Gail. Thank you, Tadinda. Um, our second panel member um, probably doesn't need very much uh, of an introduction. Um, Jeff Angel has been an um, environmental campaigner for over 40 years working on various issues. He's the director of the Total Environment Centre and CEO of Boomerang Alliance, which is an alliance of around 52 national, state and local groups. The alliance has the core value of um, creating a healthy planet through maximising resource use and creating a zero waste society. And the Alliance was instrumental in um, establishing the container deposit system in New South Wales. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks. Um, the third member of our panel is Anita Van Dyke. Anita has quite an interesting background. She qualified as a rocket scientist and has had a change of career focus and is now studying medicine in Sydney. Um, she calls herself an accidental environmentalist and has changed her from a corporate high flyer to living, uh, to working as a blogger and an author and is an author of the best-selling book, A Zero Waste Lifestyle in 30 Days. Welcome, Anita. Hi. So we're going to start off by a few general questions to the panellists and then we'll dive into questions <coughs> centred around the movie. So... Um, Jeff, the first question is directed at you. The New South Wales government is in the process of developing a plastics plan as part of the 20 year waste strategy to manage plastics. What is your view of the plan? Uh, I think the first thing to say is it's one of the last states to introduce a discussion paper on such a plan. Uh, its contents are encyclopedic in that they threw everything in there. Uh, but of course, it is a discussion or issues paper. Uh, there are some uh, standouts which 
uh, uh, identify New South Wales as doing something. Uh, the first thing, of course, is they're, they're agreeing to ban plastic bags. The last state is in years of procrastination. And finally, <clears throat> they've decided they don't have an ideological problem uh, uh, with banning lightweight plastic bags. So that's a uh, belated but good win for Minister Keane. Another area which was uh, distinguishes them from other states is they talk about mandating recycled content in packaging. And of course, that's a very important uh, driver of recycling because there's not much point collecting the stuff if you don't have a market for it. <clears throat> uh, I understand uh, they'll be bringing in some final uh, positions later this year, uh, but as I said at the beginning, they're one of the last states to move. And we already have several states well advanced on banning single-use plastic items. New South Wales has a lot of catch-up to do. I hope that because it's one of the last states, uh, it can become a best practice state and do better than everyone else. Thank you. Um, second question for you. Um, can you tell me more about the plastic free places and the single use ban campaigns that you're currently running through the Boomerang Alliance? Yes, uh, plastic free places was devised a few years ago uh, with uh, two intentions. Uh, we go into various commercial cafe eating, drinking precincts, and uh, we help uh, the numerous businesses. Uh, uh, to get rid of the plastic they're giving out, the disposables, uh, and convert to much safer alternatives, or in fact, a complete avoidance like with keep cups. Uh, the other reason we do this is as a transitional program to laws that ban certain single use items. So it's not an end in itself, uh, it's a way of uh, getting governments to show them uh, that businesses and consumers are happy uh, and comfortable with uh, uh, getting rid of the single-use plastic items uh, and that uh, bringing in banned laws is not such a big barrier or a big challenge. Uh, the states we're operating in, uh, Queensland, <coughs> uh, at the moment, just Byron Bay in New South Wales, uh, some fairly extensive precincts in South Australia. And uh, we've got some trials going on in Victoria. Uh, so far, we have removed from the business cafe to the consumer chain over 5 million items of single use plastic. Uh, and I think what's really important, that even during the COVID crisis, when people are you know, justifiably worried about uh, uh, sharing germs or sharing viruses, <coughs> uh, we've been able to get the Restaurant and Catering Association to support uh, the continuing use of keep cups, reusable cups, uh, through the contactless pour uh, process. So, you know, it's part of a very big movement to get rid of single-use plastic items. And uh, as the states bring in those laws, uh, we've got two or three more years to go uh, uh, to get Australia uh, a single-use plastic free. All right, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, mm. Mayor Gale, over to you for the next couple of questions. Uh, you've recently taken the Plastic Free July Challenge. Mm. How have you found it and what has been the biggest challenge for you? Yeah, uh, it's been fascinating because once you sit down and really analyse what your practices are, things you don't normally even think about, it's so pervading. Um, even from the morning when you get up to make a cup of coffee, you think, oh, actually the coffee machine is plastic. And then you go to your shopping, and I think shopping is the one that with Plastic Free July, you instantly think, okay, well, I'll make changes with my shopping practices. How do you buy blueberries that aren't in a plastic container? 
um, it's really challenging. And I went through and I did find that I wasn't even using my own um, netting to wrap up my vegetables. I was just putting them straight in the trolley. That worked absolutely fine. Um, I had a one of my girlfriends come up um, and say, oh, hi to me. And I looked in a trolley and I couldn't believe she'd wrapped the cauliflower in a plastic bag. And I'm thinking, why? <laughs> and so you start to become quite appalled at people's just everyday practices and not thinking about it. And different things like even buying porridge. Um, during COVID, the only porridge you could get was in the single sachets, which are very convenient because um, it's a, a specified measure and you can put your liquid in there and it's all going to get a, a lovely serve a porridge every time. However, those sachets, of course, are plastic lined. And so then it's making a change. Okay, well, I'll just get a measuring cup. You pull out your measuring cup and you realise that's plastic as well. So it's really quite um, amazing how much plastic has just invaded our everyday life. So I think Plastic Free July has been a terrific way of bringing awareness. Um, certainly even I went to um, buy some fish with my husband and he was even saying, oh, what about the fish? What about the plastic that was being used? Have you got your own bag? So it's a, um, a way I think of having a discussion with people. I found it really, really valuable and really insightful. Um, we went to our local markets here for example and bought lunch and um, and I do thank Jeff and his team for the advocacy around the keep cups for example uh, because the amount of of plastics the single-use plastic uses not only with the takeaway containers but the keep cups is mind-boggling during this COVID at, at time so um, I think that Jeff's team has done a really good job of saying okay there is a way around this whereas people were saying it's too hard uh, but then I was talking to a friend of mine going to the football. At the football, they're only serving beverages now in plastic cups. They're not even encouraging people to go to the football with their own cups that perhaps can be refilled. So uh, I think we've got a long way to go, but the discussion is a really important one. Thank you. Um, as an active bush carer, you would have seen the impact of plastics firsthand in the environment. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences and were there particular items that you were constantly finding? Yeah, and the, the COVID experience has been a good one. And back to Jeff again with the, the single cups, uh, single use cups, because part of people have been calling in and getting a takeaway and then taking their coffee cups with them for a bushwalk. We've had a lot of pressure on our bushwalk areas. We've found that there's been a lot more people using them, which we think is absolutely absolutely fantastic but it has been a real education program around asking people please take your rubbish with you and also think about the kind of things that you're taking into the bushland whether it be the single-use coffee cups for example that are going to be thrown away um, but you know take your own water bottle and take it home with you we have found that we've had to increase the cleaning of our bushland um, we have, of course, had to look at our, the way that the bushland is being managed with trails, et cetera, to ensure social distancing. So that has been a bit of a change that we've had. Um, but certainly education has played a huge part in making sure that our residents are aware. If you're leaving stuff in the bushland, it's staying there. And a lot of our beautiful bushland areas lead onto our waterways. And so, of course, it rains, the rubbish goes into our waterways, which is something we're really trying to actively prevent. Um, so education has a very, very big part in what we're doing in our bushland areas. Thank you. Anita, over to you. Um, you moved from the corporate world into an activist lifestyle. What was the trigger that changed your priorities? Well, I think I come from a different position from maybe some of the panellists is that I didn't come from an environmental background. Um, my trigger to get into the activist lifestyle actually was based on economics initially. So I was sitting in a corporate meeting, much like, um, you know, a meeting room that you normally have in, in, in the city. And I was looking at my boss, my boss and the big boss. And I thought to myself, is this what I want to do for the next 5, 10, 20 years of my life? And by then I was pretty successful. I was 27, I was running um, you know, a team, I was in corporate engineering, and I was filling up my life with the excesses that comes with living a corporate high-flying lifestyle. So the latest shoes, the latest designer handbags, but all these stuff was actually not providing me the happiness that I expected. So really it was, I was climbing this corporate ladder, but I was actually, the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. So during that time, I actually took some time off work 
and decided to do a whole new reset of my life. And that included firstly my finances, because when you're taking time off work, I uh, only had one income at the time, it was, it was my husband and my income was gone. And so I had to pare back my lifestyle and understand the things that really made me happy. And to do that, I went back to the lessons that my Chinese migrant parents taught me, which was live within my means, don't waste your resources and live more frugally. And so for me, that was the trigger. The economic side of things where living a plastic free lifestyle certainly has its benefits actually opened me to a whole new world of what our consumeristic lifestyles was doing to the planet and the world around us. So um, you describe yourself as an everyday activist. Can you outline for us what that means for you? Yeah, so I use this term everyday activist in my book because I'm really passionate about small changes making a big cumulative difference. And I think for some of us, we feel overwhelmed with the state of the world, whether it be climate change, plastic pollution. And I think that we feel like, oh, it's all just too hard. What can one individual do? So this term everyday activist is about saying that we can do things every day to make changes in our everyday lives that can make a big cumulative difference. So one thing I like to say is look at the plastic straw. We have one plastic straw uh, with our drinks and maybe we have that one every day, let's just say, with our green smoothie or whatever we have. And well, that's 365 straws a day. And then you multiply it by say 8 billion people on the planet. So just by saying no to that one straw every single day, and then having that ripple effect of other people doing it as well, we're saving millions of plastic pollution every single year. And I think, uh, you know, um, as the mayor mentioned before, you can't help but notice the plastic around us. And I actually have a really handy tip, and this is one of the first tips I like to suggest to people when they're starting on their plastic-free journey, is to actually have a zero waste kit. So a zero waste kit is this little bag that I put in my handbag, and in it I have reusables, um, most commonly which are found in beachside cleanups. So the first thing that is most commonly found in beachside cleanups is plastic bags. So I just have a foldable bag. That's in my zero waste kit. Another thing that's really commonly found, like you mentioned before, is the coffee cup. So what I have actually is a collapsible coffee cup. And this is really handy because I can actually put it in my scrub pocket. So I wear scrubs to work because I'm, um, I'm training to be a doctor. And it's really handy, you put it in and you can put in your scrubs and you can get your coffee in that. Another thing that we most commonly find is obviously the water bottle. And so I just have a glass water bottle that I bring with me everywhere. And though these things you may think, oh, it can be heavy, it can, can be cumbersome, but it's just a matter of changing your habits and putting it in a little zero waste kit, which you can carry around in your bag, handbag, or even put in your car as an easy way to not forget these things and to make these small changes. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna dive into the movie a little bit now because I, um, there's been a few questions that have come through about the movie. So Jeff, I'll start with you again. I think one of the most alarming issues that were highlighted, for me anyway, by the movie, was the fact that the reduction in fossil fuel use is actually resulting in an increase in plastic production because of um, trying to uh, uh, move that um, item over in, and use it for something else. Um, were you aware of this fact and what do you think we can do about that? Uh, I suppose I was vaguely aware but I must admit the film <laughs> certainly threw it in your face with <laughs> the degree of the problem we have. Uh, and I think there were two causes. One, yes, uh, there is some decline uh, in fossil fuel use by more efficiency in developed nations. Uh, but that's not the case with the growing middle class in Asia particularly, where more and more disposables are being uh, put onto the market. And secondly, particularly in America, uh, there's been a massive expansion of fracking, both of oil and gas. And that was about 
initially getting energy independence for America, but produce so much and are searching for a massive expansion in plastic use to support those operations. <clears throat> uh, and as we know, the uh, way big corporates work when they're trying to manipulate the market, uh, they try to get the consumer, whether it's a business or an individual, to consume more plastic. And uh, uh, that, that push is particularly happening in the developing countries of Asia and Africa. And of course, they are experiencing absolutely enormous problems uh, with plastic pollution. Just, just the images in that, that film are not only shocking, but of course they, they must be motivation uh, to do something about it. And there were local activists uh, who at the coalface are trying to do something about it in those countries. Uh, but if you know the history of the oil industry, it will use every legal and possibly sometimes illegal way of getting us to consume more of their product. Um, and linked to that point, um, corporations actually often blame ineffective waste management in the global south for the amount of plastic in our oceans. You often hear that stat about the fact that 90% of marine plastic comes from the eight Asian rivers. Now, the movie touched on this, but how do you think we can best counter this focus? Oh, I, I think we, we listen to the, to the words of the local activists in those countries. Uh, they don't want disposables flooding their markets and flooding their uh, growing consumer lifestyle. Uh, they don't want incineration. Uh, they don't want to be the dumping ground for the West's rubbish, plastic rubbish. Uh, and of course, uh, their countries need to adopt as well as avoidance, the vast majority of the packaging uh, is replacing uh, what are effectively compostable uh, containers and delivery mechanisms. Uh, I will make one exception though, which is clean water. Uh, a lot of these countries have a problem uh, with the supply of clean water and uh, water in, in plastic bottles is, is of some greater import uh, than some of the other disposable items. Now, of course, there are ways of getting that material, those disposable plastic bottles recycled and uh, uh, container deposit schemes, as are now spreading around Australia, uh, are an ideal way of doing that. <clears throat> uh, the fact that there is so much coming out of those rivers is obviously reflective of those systemic issues in those countries. But I will say that the plastic around Australia, barring to some extent the north, comes from us. You know, it's not like the plastic coming out of the rivers in Indonesia floats down to the to Bondi Beach or Manly. Uh, the plastic we find on our beaches and in and around our oceans is plastic coming off uh, uh, our land and from our litter. And when you, I don't know if you saw the images of um, the litter that was left on Bournemouth Beach after um, when we had that warm, when they had that warm weather in England, it was pretty um, outrageous. So <coughs> we're certainly doing our bit. Uh, yeah. Mayor Gale, is there anything that can be done at the local government level to counter this proliferation of waste? Yeah, I think in a word, yes. And absolutely would be the other word I would use about that because literally the rubbish ends up with us. Um, we work very hard in education, as we've said, um, and Jeff touched on the avoidance aspect, which is so important as part of this education process. Uh, so we really push the avoid, reduce, reuse and recycle as a way to reduce the waste in the first place. Uh, where there are very policy, various policies that we can have at a local council level as well, education programs. Um, but from the Northern Sydney Regional Organisation of Councils perspective, 
of with the eight member councils, we represent probably over half a million people within uh, the northern area of Sydney. We have a real voice uh, in advocacy. So we will meet with uh, the Environment Minister, the Minister for Local Government, um, Local Government New South Wales, and advocate for various reforms. And I know that Jeff touched also on the uh, 20 year waste strategy and we've met with the minister about that asking uh, for various things and one of the things we're very keen to make sure is that we don't lose the ability to have um, recycling plants or rubbish transfer areas and being able to deal with the rubbish locally rather than sending it off to all, all different places in the state. Uh, in addition to that we are supporting two small scale um, circular economy projects. Uh, so pilot programs that might go unfunded, we're funding those to try and see if we can also support a circular economy locally. Um, advocacy has got a lot of um, place in local government uh, by banding together with organisations like Local Government New South Wales, the voice of all councils together becomes a very powerful voice. Um, in addition, Willoughby Council signed a memorandum of understanding uh, with our member councils through NESROC. We were using recycled materials in our roadways, for example. So crushed glass to replace sand in concrete um, and to be used in road bases and the use of soft plastics in bitumen is another one that we're actively using. Um, we're also banding together for procurement um, because you can imagine that we are buying a lot of things and if we can procure in a more sustainable way, uh, the amount that a local government does use is quite significant. So that also gives us um, a lot of cloud at the table there. And um, other things more local, so for example, our stormwater. Um, we're really upgrading the gross pollutant traps that we have to make sure that this rubbish doesn't get into our waterways in the first place. And the City of Willoughby has 49 bush care groups that we mentioned earlier, uh, but the volunteer workforce we've got there uh, to try and clean up our bushland and uh, make sure that the rubbish isn't in a position where it's going to clog up our waterways is an important one. Um, and simple things like hand cleaning um, is another thing promoting different projects like uh, Get Fitter With Litter was one project. A uh, local person uh, was encouraging people to go around and pick up rubbish that they saw in the streets, the streets and I'm a great one for that. Um, unfortunately, COVID has put a little bit of a stop to that. People were as reluctant to go and pick up rubbish, but you can still do that in a sustainable way um, as you do with your dog poo. Uh, you can do that also by picking up um, rubbish you see in the streets. And it is amazing, um, as uh, Anita pointed out, one person can make a huge difference. So you know, plastic straws being an example, but picking up pieces of rubbish is another. If you just go and pick up a piece of rubbish in your local neighbourhood, you know, one piece a year, that's 365, um, you know, one piece a day. Uh, but often I will go out and might, might be five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pieces of rubbish. And that does make a huge difference to your local community. So I wouldn't be encouraging people um, to say how they can make their own local difference. Um, but also local government has a very strong ro role through advocacy through the different tiers of government and advocating for change there. Uh, Willoughby Council has initiated a single use plastic ban in internal operations. Can you tell us a bit more about this program and what type of incentives we can provide businesses in our area to jump on board with this? Yeah, look, I was elected to council around 10 years ago and we would have meetings that standardly and routinely only had water in plastic bottles. It was kind of nuts. And uh, then, you know, it was, okay, well, why can't we have glasses of water with water jugs? Sydney water is fantastic. So there has been a change in that. We did ad adopt um, a firm policy around not using single use plastics in our council run events. And also, for example, the mall markets now, we're encouraging those stall holders not to use single use plastics and they've come on board. It's amazing if you provide that leadership and sometimes it can be a little bit of a stick to say, okay, this is not acceptable in our premises. People do jump on board. Uh, we have a blend cafe that also avoids single use plastics has been highly successful. Um, we run a number of programs, for example, the Live Well in Willoughby. 
and uh, one of those unsurprising things of COVID, everyone has now jumped onto the Zoom education meetings. Did a fantastic one to gender. I think you led that on composting. That was really well received. Um, who knew about wet and dry compost, but I do now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's terrific that the message is getting out more broadly. Absolutely fantastic. And we also run a Better Business Partnership Program uh, where we advise businesses within our area on how they might be able to reduce their plastic use, their waste use, uh, their electricity consumption and a whole range of things. And we've had a terrific take up on that. So we do provide the tools for people to make changes in their businesses and also in their own lives. Thank you. Anita, over to you. Now you've um, touched on this, but as an activist, uh, what tips and tricks would you suggest to encourage behaviour change with the, within the community to help change purchasing decisions and reduce plastic use? Um, I think I have you know, a few tips there. I think the main thing about reducing your plastic use is firstly understanding what plastic you're using. So a tip I like to give everyone who's starting on this journey, or even if you've been through the journey for a while, is to actually do a bin audit. So actually go through with a pair of gardening gloves, the items through your recycling bin and also your trash bin, and go through what's actually the frequent flyers that are coming through. Is it takeaway packaging? Is it plastic chip containers? Is it um, you know packaging for clothing? What is the main things that you're consuming in your house and then actually make a decision with the whole household to actually find creative swaps. So the thing I love about this, um, you know, plastic free movement is that I, what I am an engineer and I love, you know, finding little hacks and creative ways to find those swaps. And that's where your own creativity can come out. You can be your own zero waste engineer to find different solutions to the problems coming into your home. So that do that. Do go through a bin audit and go through what's going in your home. Secondly, when you're making new purchasing decisions, I like to go through the, um, the hierarchy of needs. So what that really means is firstly, understanding, do you really need to buy it? So can you make do with something you already have at home? Do you actually need to buy something to solve that problem? Can you, make, can, can you make something? Can you swap something? Can you um, then buy things secondhand? So there's a huge, lovely secondhand econ economy that we can take advantage of. And finally, if you do need to buy something, buy it with a local brand that is in alignment with your values. So whether it be um, materials, whether it be you know, how the product is made, where the product is made, understand what the product actually is and do your research before you buy anything new. Um, and finally, I'd like to say, you know, consume less. So one of the great things about the, the areas that we all live in is that we can drive to places or catch the train or catch the bus or catch the ferry um, to places that, that we can hike on the weekend. A lot of my youth was spent spending a lot of time in you know, shopping centres, consuming and buying more things, when really the best things are, you know, outdoors, getting outside, bushwalking, uh, walking by the beach, having a swim. And those things are virtually free. And by getting outdoors and reducing your consumeristic habits, you can also see the precious wonders of Mother Nature and you get to appreciate what you're really fighting for. So it's more than just, uh, you know, getting exercise it's understanding the nat you know the natural patterns of the world and getting out there and being involved in the world so i think those are you know some tips that i encourage people to reduce their plastic consumption and also reduce con their consumeristic behavior in the first place so linked to that with getting out in the environment that's often where we f see the litter when we focus on litter but mm. really you know as we talked about we need to reduce production of plastic at the source so what would you as an activist see that individuals can do to lobby for this change? I think, so we've blocked, we, and I, both the panelists here really talk about like a top down approach, you know, policy decision making. And I think that's really important, but also as a, you know, a voter, as a consumer, we have to go bottom up as well. So the first tip is I always say vote with your dollar. 
So if you are putting your money towards brands, companies, organizations that you really believe in, which align with your values, which tick all the boxes that, um, that you as a consumer need, then spend your money towards those causes. You actually have a lot of power with your dollar. And also vote. You know, go out there and vote and get, you know, get involved with the political campaigning and get involved with political activism. And I like the term think global but act local. So, you know, your local elections, your uh, state elections, your federal elections are really important, but also getting involved in a volunteer basis, whether it be picking up trash or volunteering for your local community gardens or getting involved in, you know, school organisations, whatever it may be, those are individual actions that we can do to lobby for change on an everyday basis. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've had a question come in from Tobias. Um, so Jeff, this will be for you. Recycled content in packaging should be increased, but how available are these for manufacturers in Australia today? And what incentives could be given to produce um, packaging with more recycled plastic? Well, I think as um, <coughs> is me revealed in the film, the virgin material is cheaper than the recycled material. <coughs> is me. Um, so one of the things the Boomerang Alliance is working for is mandating recycled content. Uh, we have various state and federal governments talking about considering recycled content in their procurement decisions. Um, we think that's inevitably going to be too weak. Uh, and since uh, China stopped uh, as with every other western country accepting our rubbish so called mixed recycle it <clears throat> uh, we have to do something with it here uh the container deposit schemes are producing some very good quality uh plastic recycling but of course there's no point uh having mountains of this material that's got nowhere to go uh the federal government to their credit uh, is uh, pushing a $600 million uh, recycling industry development fund, uh, partly funded by them, the states and business. Uh, so that will build up our capacity. But again, unless what's being produced by those factories has a final use, the consumer, business councils, individuals, uh, then there's not much point. So the hardest thing in the current waste debate in Australia and at state and local level is to create the market for recycled content. Uh, you can imagine <coughs> uh, the finance sections and perhaps councils uh, uh, and state and federal governments saying, oh, it's all gonna cost more. There are other things we can do with the money. So it's a very big battle. Um, the thing we don't want is to have all of this material collected for recycling, not having a higher value use in the circular economy, and instead it goes to incineration. And incineration requires long-term contracts, gobbles up the material, and you end up with a very low value activity, as well as causing some pretty serious pollution and a lot of, lot of toxic residue uh, once it's incinerated. <clears throat> so, uh, it's important that consumers are demanding recycled content because that gives the economic message to the producers that they will have a market. It's important that government mandates recycled content in the products they buy. And similarly, that we pass legislation that requires business, particularly in packaging, uh, to put recycled content into their products. What we don't want uh, is this proliferation of labels, and the packaging industry is pursuing this, that say uh, this product, bottles, whatever, uh, cups, uh, are recyclable or compostable. It means nothing unless they actually are recycled or composted in practice. And that will simply lead 
to another round of incredulity about labelling and greenwash. So we still have quite a bit of work to do to get Australia into a circular economy position. And I know that means systemic change. And I know that uh, what people do individually, and it needs to certainly pointed to people taking political action when you've changed your lifestyle, convert that into a political message, and then we can start getting the big changes that are required. Thank you. Um, Mayor Gail, this is a question um, from Christina for you. Um, you. We have talked a little bit about this. Um, there seems to be a lot of cleaning of litter still to be done, even though we can't just focus on this aspect. How can this be supported locally through the community? Mm. Yeah, it is a good question because as I've touched on about uh, residents taking their own personal responsibility, um, it <coughs> is very easy when you're out walking your dog or just walking and enjoying our lovely bushland. Anita, I'm very pleased to hear that you're a great bushwalker like I am. I just love being out in that natural environment. Um, if you do see rubbish, um, think about taking the responsibility yourselves, not just saying, mm, isn't that terrible, someone else has dumped that rubbish, uh, but actually picking it up yourself and that's going to make a huge difference. But also the key thing is avoidance in the first place. Uh, we are really pushing the avoidance thing, uh, as Anita said, really think, do you need this? Do you need this product in your life? Is there another way that you can be doing this? And reducing that um, consumerism, I think, will also help. And it is an education process for our broader community as well. Anita, this is one for you from Fran. Um, she said her daughter's out tonight at a venue where she's always taken her metal straw, but it's now not allowed. Um, and they've gone back to plastic. Is there hope to return to more sustainable practices post COVID? Yeah, so um, I'm training as a doctor. So I think that I've read a lot of papers about this, the, the, you know, the virus sticking to various materials and whatnot. And there's actually been a paper put out by 100 scientists who say that reusables are actually fine. So your keep cups and your reusable straws are actually quite safe to use if it's your own individual straw, if it's your own individual keep cup. Um, and I'll provide a link to that paper maybe later on. But I think the interesting part of this is that in this COVID world, there are some things that we need plastic for. And I think a lot of us can agree that we're not anti-plastic, we're anti what I call silly use plastic. So that means the, you know, um, the plastic bag for the cauliflower that you mentioned before, or the plastic bag for two bananas. Um, so I think from a medical perspective, that we, we do need single use items for particular reasons until we can find materials that are safe to use in the medical field in the long term. So in that instance, I think COVID has taken us back a little bit, but I would like to remind us that COVID isn't gonna stick around forever, fingers crossed, <laughs> and that our own individual zero waste kits are actually perfectly safe to use. And can I suggest that Plastic straws aren't really needed for a lot of purposes. A lot of us have a thing called mouths <laughs> and they're really functional. You know, I mean, a lot of my patients may need straws because they have medical conditions or they're young children. And so they may need straws, but there's also alternatives to those. There's things such as paper straws. And I've seen actually wonderful straws made out of pasta and they're all biodegradable materials that are not plastic. So for her, I would suggest making a change by suggesting to, you know, the restaurant, whatever it is, to invest in those other options. Yes, sorry, can I just come in? <clears throat> uh, the, the debate about this has been more pronounced in America where it's been ideological and they're bringing in bans on bags and other single-use items and the way America is, it all became highly polarised. Uh, but if you check out the health advice from the health departments across the states, uh, Australian states, uh, the Restaurant and Catering Association, the advice is you really don't get much from uh, packaging from the surfaces of, of, of what the food is being delivered in. And of course, as Anita says, if it's your own uh, uh, particular item, which nobody else touches, which is a hell of a lot better than someone handing you a drink with a straw they've touched, mm -hmm. or you have the contactless pour, 
where it's your cup, you keep hold of it, they pour the coffee in, you're being a lot safer than people hand handling all those plastic items to get it to you. Mm. Mm. Jeff, this one's for you from Christina again, I think. Um, is the cash for container scheme a bad idea, given that it makes consumers feel they can do something and lets manufacturers off the hook when the problem of plastic needs to be tackled <coughs> at its source? Uh, that's a very <laughs> <laughs> challenging question because we spent 13 years <laughs> trying to get container <laughs> deposits in place. But uh, as in Germany, you can create a deposit structure which encourages reusable containers, i.e. in the case of Germany, beer bottles where they are washed and reused again. <clears throat> uh, and I always said to people who put forward that particular issue that yes, let's get container deposits first. We are stuck with an enormous absolutely enormous amount of disposable bottles and cans, about 17 billion a year used in Australia, and we have to get them out of the litter stream and get them into recycling. The next stage is, yes, uh, either avoiding uh, buying water bottles, for example, and at some stage getting reusables back into the system, <clears throat> uh, the beverage container people are certainly talking about much more recycled content and that's worthwhile and the container deposit systems are able to produce food grade recycled content and one of the technical issues that what you get what you get out of your curbside yellow bin is not much use because it's contaminated <clears throat> um, so it's a long battle but uh, uh, we certainly haven't let it drop off the agenda <laughs> Thanks. Um, Mayor Gale, um, Bobby has asked, um, does it help if residents approach local councils? And if so, how and who should they approach if they want to make a change? Which is a bit tricky because it's not always within our remit. But. Yeah, it does depend on the issue, but certainly local councils are very able to make adjustments quite quickly. If um, he has a particular idea, I'd love to hear it. Um, we have a big sustainability area. You're part of that and part of the education team as well. Um, and we're always after new ideas and innovations. And sometimes a resident can come up with something quite simple, which is very easy for a local government to implement. So I would be encouraging him to reach out perhaps to the elected members or simply write a little letter to the CEO. And uh, we can certainly look into that. Um, the Get Fitted with Litter was a great case in point where Don Wilson, uh, who was also the established, established the Bush Cares Major Day Out, um, another you know local innovation that went national, um, said, okay, I've got an idea, let's get on board. And we thought it was a good idea, so we supported it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a terrific way for people to take ownership too of, um, of making change within their community. Jeff, what's your view of bioplastics? Are they a solution or will they create their own problems down the track? Uh, well, the problem is that bioplastics have become a generic term uh, so that uh, people can think that the product they're buying is going to biologically decompose in the environment. Uh, the vast majority of so-called bioplastics don't do that even if they're not made out of oil, as that film uh, very clearly demonstrated, if you've got the same carbon chain as the fossil fuels that, that, that go into the plastic, or the plastic has the same carbon chain, then it's when they sit around the environment uh, uh, not decomposing and causing damage in the ocean. <clears throat> the Boomerang Alliance has adopted a very firm position uh, that the alternatives where people do want uh, single uses uh, must meet the Australian standards for composting. And there's one standard for commercial composting and another standard for home composting. Uh, you can imagine some of the pushback we're getting from some of the companies that are very energetic about their greenwashing, their labelling. 
Uh, but uh, we are starting to convince the state governments when they're bringing in uh, the ban laws uh, that the only alternatives uh, to those particular single-use items where people really want them is where they meet that Australian standard. Um, Anita, um, there's a question here from Anita about a waterproof shopping bag. Do you know of any waterproof shopping bags that's not that aren't plastic? So waterproof shopping bags that aren't plastic, that's a tricky one. The one that I use is actually made of recycled plastic. So um, as the panelists mentioned before, that we do have plastic already existing on the planet and it's great to have um, designers, product makers, use that for a resource. So I suggest her looking up um, brands such as Anya, not to promote any brands, I'm not affiliated with them, but Anya is a brand that has um, bags that are waterproof that's made out of recycled plastic and they're an Australian brand from Perth. So. Thank you. Now we've um, just got 10 minutes left so we're going to actually have to leave the other questions but we, we have got a record of them and we will try and get back to all participants with answers to those after the event. But I'd like to invite our panellists just to do a bit of a wrap up and a bit of a call to action. So what can participants do in this space? So um, I'll start with you, Megan. Right. Thanks, Jaginda. And thank you for the opportunity. Also, I want to shout out to Anita and Jeff for being participants. It's been terrific. I've learnt lots just by being on this panel with you. So thank you very much for giving up your evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I think the key message from a local government perspective is to really focus on what you can do yourself. If you're unsure, um, Willoughby Council has a whole world of information on their website. Um, sometimes we find that people are confused, for example, about what they can put in their recycling recycling bins. Um, I do my own audit as I fish out the stuff that ends up in uh, our kitchen rubbish that the children tend to find, throw in there and I'm always fishing it out saying this is recyclable and waving it under those, it's got to go in the right bin. Uh, but I think it is up to mm. us to provide role models within our families to create that messaging. Um, but not only with our families but more broadly. I know when I talk to my friends, for example, about what I'm doing, Plastic Free July is a great case in point. Uh, just having that conversation and making sure that there's that awareness. The awareness around that avoid, reduce, reuse and recycle is really important. Um, the messaging around you can make a difference yourself. Um, and education is a big part of it. We have lots of fantastic courses. For example, we've got green cleaning coming up on Saturday, the 25th of July. And that's practical tips on how to reduce the impact on your cleaning products in your home. I'm really looking forward to that one. And uh, really making sure that you are just aware of what's out there and the implications, for example, of the decisions that you're making. What happens to that single use plastic bag that's on your cauliflower? Uh, what, where does that end up? Um, and I think people will be quite surprised about the implications of the small decisions that they're making. Um, recycling is another big one as well. So um, don't lose the faith, the faith. Um, keep up the good work, educate and inform yourselves would be my key messages. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, a wrap up? <laughs> Uh, I think we've entered a very critical stage in Australia uh, in how we treat the resources that we've been, we've been wasting so long. Uh, and there is quite a lot of momentum at government level and in the community. Uh, in terms of plastic, uh, the Boomerang Alliance is pushing very hard to have all states to pass laws banning those various polluting single-use items, or as Anita said, silly items, uh, by next year. Uh, and we've certainly got some good momentum from a number of states. Uh, let's hope New South Wales catches up. Uh, we are also very strongly uh, urging uh, people to oppose uh, waste incineration. Uh, we don't really have uh, much of that in New South Wales, but there are some very big proposals uh, coming on. Frankly, they need lots of disposable plastic to, to survive and they lock up contracts of it for 20 years. So it's in their interests 
to have lots of wasted plastic and that shouldn't be allowed to interfere uh, with the recycling and circular economy programs uh, of local government and states. And finally, we really have to develop uh, a very strong coalition of interests uh, that insist on recycled content standards. And if in the next few years we can achieve that, then Australia will finally step up from <laughs> the age of landfill into the age of a circular economy. Thank you. And Anita, um, I guess I have two main things. First one being aim for progress, not perfection. So a lot of us feel overwhelmed with, you know, big changes in our lifestyle, whether it be zero waste living, plastic free living or changing any part of your life. And we can feel like it's all consuming and it's all too much. But I like to remind people it's about the small things that you do every day that make a big cumulative difference. And sustainability has to be sustainable for you. So that means, you know, making the changes for the long term rather than for the short term. So that might mean making small things such as bringing your coffee cup or bringing your straw every day, but doing that consistently over time and encouraging other, people's, other people to do it as well. Um, my second tip is also what William McDowell, he produced this uh, beautiful book called Cradle to Cradle. And it's really a design book for engineers, product makers, but also consumers to understand that we need to transition our lives and our economy and the way we live to a cradle to cradle mentality rather than cradle to grave. Because at the moment, we as the consumer only can see what happens when the product is produced and then it goes away into landfill. But there's no such thing as a way. A way is, is, is somewhere. So I really want to remind people that we as consumers have that power to understand and investigate brands, organisations, uh, political, political parties, um, and be, be advocates for change. And we have, that to, we have that power within us to do that. And that's the definition of living in a democratic society. So we're very lucky in that way. Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Maya Gail, Jeff Angel and Nita Van Dyke. That's been um, a fascinating panel. I will actually send through some resources to all the participants after the event. But um, yeah, we'll end it there. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having yes. us. Thank you.